an inadequacy is a pathway that you can travel down, Ooh. right? A recognized inadequacy is as soon as it's such a gift in some sense, if, if it's accurate. I'm in it because you think, well, what should I do? What should I do with my life? That's a real complicated question. Right. Oh, here's an inadequacy. Excellent. You have a pl- you have a, a goal now. Rectify it. Now, you still have to think strategically and figure out how to rectify it and do it step by step. And But Carl Rogers, the psychotherapist, um, pointed out that the per- person for security for therapy to be successful, the person has to want to change. So they have to have recognized that they have a problem. If the, if someone is mandated by the court to attend therapy, it's very difficult for the therapist to convince them that they have a problem. Once you're convinced you have a problem, it's like, away you go. You know, I know it's still technically difficult. It requires discipline and all of that. There's no magic solution, but... If you're plagued by feelings of inferiority, you should rectify the most obvious inferiorities. Right. Focus on those first over optimizing strengths, would you say? No, not necessarily. Not not necessarily. I'm and you don't have to redress every like I can't I'm a terrible jazz musician. <laughs> You know, it's and not a, it's not an it's not a thing where you hold shame around or like Well, it's not an impediment. Yeah, yeah. I would say that you have to rectify an inadequacy when it's clearly an impediment to your goal or you have to shift goals. But if you're shifting goals because of an inadequacy related impediment, then you have to ask yourself, are you, is your desire to shift the goal reliable or are you just taking the easy way out? You can protect yourself by, by picking a different goal that's more difficult. That That's a good mental hygiene practice because sometimes you should switch goals rather than rectifying inadequacies but you can fool yourself then and and that's that's not good and and if someone is goalless lazy unmotivated not sure what they want to do what would be a few key steps to get started to to turn their life around or to find the motivation for something greater than where they're at well, I, I think a fair bit of that's probably to be found in, you can find it in shame. You can find it in guilt. You can find it in conscience. You can find it in anger. You can find it in interest and, and, and engagement and beauty. There's lots of pathways. If you're angry about something in the world, well, you know, that's an indication that that's in some sense your problem, right? It, it's speaking to you in a moral sense. This shouldn't be that way. Well, maybe you're the person who should do something about it in some manner. Maybe it'll take your whole life to figure out how to do that. But it's bothering you for a reason. So that the negative emotions can be a pathway to transformation. I'm, I'm not trying to romanticize them. They can crush you completely and leave you with nothing. Yeah. Right? Uh, for sure. And they can go badly astray. But shame, that's a good one. What am I ashamed of? Well, can you fix any of that? Because you might ask yourself, let's say you're so ashamed and so crushed that you're nihilistic and you can't see any hope for life. You're just done. You might think, well, what if I was less ashamed? Mm. Like, I'm not going to jump off the bridge today. I'm going to wait a year. I'm going to not, I'm going to work on these things that I'm ashamed of. And, and just see, like, does my life improve enough so that I'm not so bitter about it now or I'm not so hopeless about it now? And j- my experience has generally been that that works. It works. And then some of, some of it's practical knowledge, too. It's like you can get a really long way with very small changes, incremental changes, yeah. micro habit changes. So aim low. thing that I've said to people has become this crazy internet meme, but that's to clean up your room, and <laughs> which, which is a lot better and more useful than people think. It's a lot harder, too, but the, the thing, the first thing you do, I think, and I learned this in part from Solzhenitsyn when he was trying to iron out his soul when he was in the gulag, because he was trying to figure out how he got there, how he contributed to how he got there. You know, not Stalin and Hitler, even though they were kind of to blame, you know, but there wasn't much he could do about that. I think what you have to do, and and this is part of humility, is you have to look around you 
within your sphere of influence, like the direct sphere of influence, and fix the things that announce themselves as in need of repair. And those are often small things, you know, and, and they can be like your room, put it in order. Because the thing is, it isn't exactly so important that your room is in order, although it is. What's important is that you learn how to distinguish between chaos and order and to be able to act in a manner that produces order. And in most households, there's a hundred things that could be done to just make it less hideous and horrible. And so practicing that is, it's a real useful form of meditation. And it's also, it's also, I think it's a divine act because you're taking chaos. And you know, if you pay attention even to a room, it's so interesting. And I learned, because I've, I've renovated many places now and tried to make them beautiful. And one of the things that I've really learned is that even if you own a structure, unless you've investigated all the nooks and crannies and cleaned them up and, and, and put your own imprint on them and made them yours, they're not yours. The mere fact of physical ownership doesn't make them yours. You have to establish a dynamic relationship with the objects before they're actually yours. And I think you can, you can do something as simple as just sit on your bed and think, okay, there's probably like five things I could do today so that tomorrow morning is slightly better than this morning was. At least, or at least I'm not falling behind. And those will usually be, it's like having to eat a toad in the morning, right? It's like, it's not going to be something you want to do. There'll be things you're trying to avoid. They're snakes, essentially. But if you ask yourself, like you're asking someone, which I think is a form of prayer, if you ask yourself, instead of telling yourself, you know, what is it that I could do to set things more right today that I would actually do? It's usually some small thing because you're not that disciplined, you know. Then you can go do it. And then you, you put the world together a little more when you do that. And that spreads out. But you also, put your, you also construct yourself into something that's better able to call order forth from... And that makes you just incrementally stronger. And then the next day, you can maybe take on a slightly larger task. And like you get the benefit of compound interest if you do that. It's a tremendously powerful technique. And I think if you do that, at some point, instead of just having to fix things up that are not good, you'll start to get a glimmer of the positive things that you could do, you know, the positive things that you could do that would actually constitute a vision. And that, that's what I would recommend. The problem with a big goal is that it's daunting enough so that it might paralyze you and there's a high probability of failure. And so imagine that you're your own child. Okay, now imagine you love this child and you would like him, we'll say him because it's you and I talking, yeah. to succeed. Now you have an ideal for this child. You'd like him to grow up to be the best he can be, better than you, the best man he can be. That's what you want for your son, if the good part of you is talking. Yeah. You definitely want him to be better than you are, but you want him to be the best he could be, if your vision is unclouded. Okay, but then you offer him a goal. It's like, well, do this. Well, can he do it? Well, if he can do it without a second's thought, there's no challenge in it. There's no developmental impetus. It's not in the zone of proximal development. You want a goal that you can do but that requires some improvement on your part. Because you want to attain the goal, that's satisfying, but then you want to make yourself into the thing that can attain goals. That and so you want to push you yourself. Yeah. You, you want to, to push yourself you a bit far. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and, and there, there's an ample psychological literature that suggests that that's where maximal motivation is to be found. Interesting. So you're, you're pursuing a goal, but you're also pursuing the goal of transforming yourself at the same time.
genuine ethical accomplishment is the best source of security, but it's not un unerring. When you mean ethical accomplishment, do you mean doing something good, right? Whether people know about it or not, just good and right for yourself. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Do, or does someone else need to acknowledge that this was good and right? Um, I, I think if if you if you've done it for yourself, that's good. But if yeah. you do it and other people are in on it and and along for the ride, that's also good. Sometimes that's better.